Hey guys, I'm Hannah Cox with Days Politics, and this week I have a special one-off episode for you. If you're interested in tech, AI, and all of the policies flying around that might end up regulating them, you're going to want to tune in for this. We're at the forefront of yet another technological revolution. While some might argue that the past 30 years have been an endless stream of technological revolutions, and I would mostly agree, the dawn of AI is opening up a brand new chapter. Back in the 1990s, when the internet was first getting going, we were in the wild, wild west. And fortunately for us, the people who were in power during that time took a lot of care when it came to how they were going to regulate the internet, making sure that two things were protected at all cost. And those two things were free speech and a free market. Basically said like, we should have a market driven arena for digital commerce. We should have free trade. And when we have problems develop, we should have more decentralized solutions, multi-stakeholder processes, crowdsource solutions. It was a beautiful vision. We got really good regulations at the time, like Section 230 that I've done an entire video on that ensured these two forefronts were protected. And because of that forethought, obviously, the internet took off. I don't know if this is common knowledge, but the U.S. tech sector dwarfs that of any other country. If you compare the U.S.'s tech sector to, say, that of Europe's, it's actually pretty embarrassing for them. And that's because they didn't do a good job regulating the internet in their countries. But as AI continues to advance quite rapidly, it's stoking the normal fears we see in people and in politicians when there's a new technological revolution at hand. Obviously, there are always people who worry about any new technological advance taking away their jobs. This is a powerful technology, and it's coming fast. And if it uh, kind of goes into the wild mm -hmm. the way social media did without us thinking through the consequences, uh, we could have bigger problems with AI. We will have bigger problems with AI national security problems, job displacement problems. That's a whole other episode for another day. There's a very good podcast called Build for Tomorrow that addresses this. But in reality, the way this always plays out is yes, some jobs are eliminated, usually crappier ones, but new jobs are created. And that's surely what we'll see happen with AI as well. We also see with every new technological advance that jobs get easier. There are new tools that speed it up, which all in all should equal all of us having to work fewer hours. That hasn't played out as fast as it should because unions ingrain the 40-hour work week into public policy and our health care. But the truth is, we need fewer and fewer hours of the day to get most jobs completed. And that's thanks to technology. AI has that same propensity. Yes, of course, it is going to eliminate some jobs, but it's going to make others a lot easier and faster to do. All of this is very dependent, of course, on how the government handles AI. Naturally, there is going to be a push to regulate it because everybody wants to get a piece of the pie. Politicians often feel compelled to do something in response to the fears of their citizens, even if they're not valid. One of the dangers there, why everybody's kind of freaking out, is that it learns how to identify patterns that can help it learn quicker. So it's teaching itself to teach itself faster. And because unions are at their lowest point in American history, and I do mean lowest point, guys, like their membership, as soon as we pass laws saying that you cannot be forced to join a union in many states called right to work laws, their membership bottomed out. It turns out most people don't want to join a union when given the chance. And I get why. Unions are mostly just good jobs for people who are bad workers. If you're a good worker, you get held down by the lowest common denominator within them. But because their membership is bottoming out, that means so is their bank accounts. And because their bank accounts are bottoming out, so are the bank accounts of many politicians that they have formerly funded. So they have been pushing a grab bag of public policies trying to address this in recent years. They've tried everything from banning contract work, which is asinine, like people who are freelancing do not want to be forced to work a nine to five job with a union. I understand why they want us to have to do that. But freelancers enjoy the autonomy, enjoy the freedom, and we also get paid a lot more money typically. Thanks to public outcry and the fact that most politicians have not absolutely lost their minds, they've been mostly thwarted in those goals. So now they're trying a new front, which is attacking AI. Recently, we saw the massive writer strike coupled with the actors and director strike in Hollywood, where their unions effectively shut down that entertainment industry for months on end to negotiate new contracts. And while on the surface, these fights revolved around their desire to ensure writers and actors and directors got higher pay, there were a lot of smaller line items baked into those deals. 
that didn't get nearly as much publicity. And one of those was a clause promising that Hollywood studios would not use AI to replace screenwriters. Now, this was a massive win for those unions. They secured much higher pay. It's why you're all now paying for streaming services left and right because the revenue models no longer work thanks to these deals they worked out. Unions are only able to get higher wages for their employees that are above what the market would actually demand by passing the cost on to everybody else. But anyways, they got their wish list. They should be happy, right? But no. It's not good enough because, again, they are bleeding money. This was a win in California in one industry, but they are by no means satisfied with just that. So they have now turned their attention to another entertainment capital, that of Nashville, Tennessee, where I happen to have spent the first 13 years of my working life. Nashville is, of course, home to one of the largest music industries in the country. It is the songwriting capital of the world. And thanks to the crazy progressive policies in places like New York and California that have typically housed a lot of the movie production industry, many companies have been moving to Nashville for that as well. We've seen a huge influx of film productions coming to the state in recent years, not to mention companies like the Daily Wire moving their headquarters there. So it makes sense why that would be the next battlefront for these unions. Recently, we saw a piece of legislation introduced by the governor's team at the behest of the Recording Academy and SAG-AFTRA. They've dubbed it the Elvis Act, and purportedly the point of this legislation is to ensure that a person's voice cannot be replicated by AI for commercial purposes. If that were what it actually did, it would be pretty common sense and rank and file. But alas, that's really not what this legislation does whatsoever. It's very much a sleight of hand. And I'm not even sure how much the people within these unions are aware of that. I've seen entertainers like Natalie Grant and Chrissy Metz from This Is Us appearing before the Tennessee legislature to lobby in favor of this bill and in the process showcasing that I don't think they've actually read this bill. So let me explain what it actually does for you. Currently, the Elvis Act is not limited to AI at all. It actually has very little to do with AI whatsoever in its actual language. Instead, it basically outlaws using or replicating a person's voice without their permission for just about everything. And this is really, really unusual. We have had for decades laws called right of publicity laws that already govern the use of somebody's name, likeness, and image. And these are really good laws. You will not typically hear me say that about very many public policies, but these are good. I do believe in intellectual property. I think that people have a right to their name and likeness and image and voice. And I don't believe that others should be able to steal that likeness, image, or voice and profit off of it without the person's permission or payment. Now, for those who don't know my backstory, I have a vested interest in this fight. First and foremost, I went to Belmont University in Nashville. I was a singer-songwriter for several years in the state. After I graduated college, I worked at Entertainment One for five years, the vast majority of that time as a director of music licensing, where my job was to play songs that we owned in TV shows, commercials, films, and video games for a profit. And now I own not one, but two content creation companies where I make the vast majority of my living doing this, giving people my opinion, my thoughts, my insights. And I'm able to do that because I have built a brand in large part based on my face, my name, my likeness, my voice, my delivery that people want to listen to and get information from that has sway over lawmakers and people who make decisions in public policy. And therefore I profit off of these things. Now that took a ton of work and time and initiative to build that kind of career. So it would be very, very problematic for me if a company all of a sudden decided to use AI to replicate my face, my voice, my image, and have it deliver opinions based on my own words I've written on the internet in the past that would severely undercut my business. So I would agree that we need rules to ensure that doesn't happen. But that needs to be done in a constitutional pro-capitalism way that does not impede on the free speech and free expression of others. All you would need to do that would be to simply extend right of publicity laws as they currently exist to include voice. The reason right of publicity laws are really, really good is because they have significant exemptions to ensure the free speech rights of others are protected and also to ensure that the public, which has a vested interest in being able to obtain information in a timely and accurate way, does not have a barrier in the way of that. So currently, as written, right of publicity laws say you can't use a person's name, likeness, or image for commercial purposes, which would include things like advertising, merchandising, or fundraising. If you're going to do that, you have to get their permission and probably work out some kind of a payment structure with them. But that's where they end. And here's the really important part. They include explicit exemptions for newsworthy items. Newsworthy items pertain to anything where there is a public interest. And that's a really broad category. It includes everything from hard news to commentary to satire to parody to even celebrity gossip. 
If these exemptions did not exist, you could not have things like The Daily Show. Most of YouTube couldn't exist, actually. But the problem with the Elvis Act is it does no such thing. It does not limit itself to just commercial purposes, and it does not include these clear exemptions. Now, lobbyists on the ground have been working behind the scenes for the past two weeks to try to fix these problems, and I do want to commend a person in leadership in the Tennessee House. His name is William Lamberth. He's a Republican. He's been shepherding this bill, and to his immense credit, he is taking these concerns very seriously. And he did recently bring an amendment, which at the very least would ensure that this law does not apply to things like parody or satire or documentaries. But there's still a lot more work that needs to be done. Here are just a few of the remaining problems with these bills that should concern absolutely everybody, which I'll get to in just a minute. First and foremost, just because there are exemptions does not mean that that's crystal clear in the law. It is very likely that many people could still get sued under this legislation as it currently stands. And that's because it is simply far too broad. Now, the First Amendment does still stand and it would trump a state law. But if you get sued, you have to be able to afford an attorney and go in and defend yourself. And you probably won't get that money back even if you win. You shouldn't have to have money to hire an attorney and have to go to court in order to exercise your First Amendment, plain and simple. And even just the threat of that potential is going to quell the flow of information quite quickly. People will choose to just not make content, not speak out, and avoid the threat of being sued altogether. As it stands, if you are a YouTuber and you are reacting to clips of people saying and doing things online without their permission, you could still be sued under this bill and likely will be. That is unless you go get their express permission and pay them first, which that in and of itself would drastically slow down the process of making content. As I mentioned, I used to be a director of music licensing, and in order to play songs, you have to get permission from a lot of people in that process, usually the label and the publisher, and sometimes even the artists themselves. And that process can take weeks. Furthermore, because as I mentioned, this build does not even just pertain to AI replications. If you're a tribute band, you could get sued. Even if you're not an actual content creator, if you upload content, let's say from a concert that has somebody in it next to you and their voices in it, you could get sued. Another thing right of privacy laws typically do, they differ somewhat state to state, but they typically try to ensure that they only apply to people who are famous or have some kind of a following. This ensures G.I. Joe and Jane don't get sued for uploading their Instagram video while also protecting people who have built a career with their name, likeness, image, and voice. Oftentimes, you'll also see states limit right of publicity laws to people who are living or dead, and certainly they're typically limited to people who live within the state. The Elvis Act does none of that. So that means no matter where you live, you could be sued in Tennessee, and it will become a hotbed for lawsuits like this because of that fact. We need limits in place to make sure there's not tons of frivolous lawsuits being thrown at a court at a given time. Because again, even if the case gets thrown out, you still have to pay to defend yourself. Because of how they've written this right now, Tennessee is inviting people to come there and sue other people. If I didn't know better, I would think the Trial Lawyers Association wrote this versus sag after and the Recording Association, because that's who it's going to make a lot of money for. And lastly, right of publicity laws are limited to a commercial use. The Elvis Act is not. And not only is the bill not currently limited to people who actually have a Tennessee domicile, it appears that the bad ideas coming to Tennessee are not limited to its state's borders. Because just this week, Kentucky lawmakers picked up the exact same legislation and introduced it there, meaning this is about to be a whack-a-mole to try to stomp out bad ideas around the country. Typically on these kinds of issues, I would just tell people if they live in Tennessee to reach out to their lawmakers because that's who it actually impacts. But because of the way this law is written, absolutely everybody needs to reach out to Tennessee representatives and senators right now especially if you are a content creator, a YouTuber, a TikToker, or even if you're somebody who just enjoys these platforms, go ahead and reach out to them because this is kind of Mayday. All right, guys, I'll wrap it there. I hope you feel a little bit more empowered to take action and participate in your system with this information. Be on the lookout for this legislation in a state near you and make sure you share these videos with others because they need to hear a huge outcry from all of us on YouTube to ensure that this bill gets fixed before it's too late. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you can stay informed on pressing issues like this one. Drop me a like and a comment. Let me know your thoughts and I'll see you next time. If you like this video, you'll probably like others in my series based here and don't forget to subscribe.